This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Okay, so this movie sucked and it sucked because they cut the music. Now this isn't some, oh no, where's all the music? Why did they get rid of Mushu? Kind of thing. No, there's a clear structural reason as to why this film was so poorly received and it completely revolves around the music. Now, when I first heard that they were cutting all the music, honestly, I wasn't quite sure how to feel about it. See, and this is something that's been really bothering me about these live action Disney remakes. It's how they've somehow been so incredibly financially successful, but have also left almost no cultural impact. Like people seem to forget that the first half of these remakes cut a lot of the music out. The Jungle Book cut out some numbers, same with Cinderella. Alice in Wonderland had no songs whatsoever. So I figured eh, maybe cutting the music could work, especially considering how the director, Nikki Caro, doesn't really seem to have any experience with musicals at all. Maybe it'd be a better fit in the end of the day if they just went with something non-musical. Fine. But when you look up why they decided to nix the music, you get some flavor of, oh, we were going for a more realistic tone, which like, okay. Woman that can turn into bird is fine, and cloth magic with arrow kicking and little girl ninja reflexes is all realistic, but heaven forbid we break into song. <sighs> Alright. So in order to explain why this film failed so badly, believe it or not, we're gonna have to cover opera. Now look, I know that opera has this air of snobbery to it and everyone thinks it's super complicated, it's this quantum physics of music kind of thing. It's not. It's just what rich people in Europe used to watch before Disney invented superhero movies. That's it. But look, on the whole, opera is not that complicated. It can be, and that's what I call a fun Sunday night because I'm boring as hell, but opera in general is really formulaic. Just let me show you how it works. So in traditional Western European opera, you know, the kind of thing that you think of whenever there's someone screaming over an orchestra on stage or the Looney Tunes, I guess, you can break all the vocal music into two categories, recitative or recitative, depending on who you're talking to, and aria. Recitative is when people sing the plot to you. The story moves along when someone's singing a recitative. <laughs> Aria, on the other hand, is when everything stops and someone stands on stage and screams their feelings to the back wall. Literally, the whole show comes to a stop and one of the characters has a therapy session on stage in musical form. These European operas are, on the whole, basically rotating between recitative and aria. Recitative moves the plot along and then the plot stops for an aria where a character reflects on what's going on. That's it. That's opera. Typically in a concert setting when someone's performing a single piece from an opera, it tends to be aria, not always, but more often than not. Arias are kind of written for vocalists to flex. It's supposed to be where the characters are at the most emotionally intense. Maybe they're angry or they're just so in love that they can't hold on to it anymore. Sometimes it's literally just to introduce themselves. You get the idea. So you know Ness and Dorma, you know Ness and Dorma. That's an aria from Puccini's Turandot. It's about this guy Caliph who falls in love with the princess after seeing her once, because of course he does, but in order to marry her, he has to answer three riddles. If he gets any of them wrong, he gets beheaded. This whole piece is, damn, she's thick, I'm totally gonna win Jeopardy tomorrow. <laughs> Literally, the lyrics here are Vanish, O oh night, fade you stars, fade you stars. At dawn, I will win, I will win, I will win. Now, recitative, on the other hand, I'm not gonna lie, it's super boring. I'm convinced that recitative is why people don't listen to opera anymore. Recitative is performed in a half sung, half spoken style. You normally hear people saying that it's sung, but in a more spoken word style, just to be as confusing as possible. And that's on a spectrum. So, some recitative are more song like, which we call recitativo accompagnato, or accompanied recitative. <laughs> And other recitative is much more like spoken word, which we call recitativo secco, or dry recitative. And you'll notice that the music is written to facilitate that kind of performance. In a secco recitative, they'll have a few chords here and there, but they'll really leave a lot of open space for the vocalist to express the line how they want to without having to follow the orchestra. On the other hand, in accompagnato, or accompanied recitative, it's gonna feel a lot more like what you expect from, you know, a piece of music, or like a song. If you watch my video on Cats and Les Mis, this is basically how and why everything went wrong. Jackman talks about Les Mis being mostly recitative, which I guess is true, there's a lot of boring speak singing in Les Mis. Can it be only a day since we met and the world was reborn? If 
I should fall in the battle to come, let this be my goodbye. But he thinks that that means that he can perform it secco, when at best it's written accompagnato. He, along with the rest of the cast, tried to take more liberty with their performances when the instrumental accompaniment didn't allow for it, and it all backfired horribly. And really, that's it. That's opera. Assuming that you only speak English, the only barrier for entry now is that most operas aren't in English. At least the good ones aren't. <laughs> Now, in the late 1800s, with people like Wagner writing these opera cycles that lasted 14 some odd hours, some people were like, hey, what if we, like, don't want to spend all day in the theater to listen to an opera? What if, like, opera wasn't like math homework or something? What if instead of 12 hours, maybe it was only two? What if we cracked a few jokes here and there? Maybe add a dance number or two? Throw in a wet t-shirt contest just to make it exciting? You know, fun for the whole family. <laughs> This was the birth of something called operetta, or light opera, or opera buffa, or comic opera, depending on where you are and how badly you want to upset whoever you're talking to. Just a disclaimer, all of these are technically different and mean different things and have appeared at different points in history, but I just don't have time to go over all of it right now. This is supposed to be a video about Mulan and I'm ranting about opera. And I'm serious about the wet t-shirt contest. A few of the things that they added to operetta was burlesque and cabaret. They really knew how to put on a show. Now, not everyone liked operetta. One of my favorite quotes about operetta goes like this. It is a form for certain dramatic oppressions, those miniature compositions full of bullshit, which one finds only cold songs and couplets from vaudeville. If you haven't figured out who said that, that was Mozart. <laughs> Opera snobs have been around for hundreds of years. You can look at operetta like diet opera. All the fun, but a fraction of the calories. But one of the ways that they turned opera into operetta was they took all the recitative and converted it into dialogue. And then they left the arias as they were. If it moved the plot along, they turned it into dialogue. Only to stop and sing when the emotions built up too much and we needed someone to tell us how in love they were or how much they were going to kill someone. Instead of recitative and aria, now it was dialogue and aria. And over the years, with some more elements of vaudeville added in, way more dancing and a greater emphasis on acting, we saw the genesis of musical theater as we know it today. The Pirates of Penzance, for example, written by Gilbert and Sullivan in the 1880s, is the show where we get the modern major general. I am the very model of a modern major general, lave information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the fight historical from marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. It's technically a comic opera, which is what the English call an operetta, but it was modernized in 1981 and won the Tony for Best Revival. This is, more or less, how contemporary musical theater came to be. So when you look at the musical numbers of a West Western stage musical, you're looking at something that is the direct descendant of the aria from European opera. It's a moment where a character is reflecting on what's going on around them, like trying to defy gravity, or dreaming a dream, or not being a loser. It's where the character transforms their emotions into musical form and conveys them to the audience. In some cases, it's just them identifying themselves and what they want and who they are. Other times, it'll be them conveying how a situation has affected them. So now that I've bored you to death with opera, let's do a thought experiment. If we were going to take a film and make it a musical, where where would you add the musical numbers and why? Well, if the musical numbers in musicals function similarly to arias in opera, then you want to break into song whenever a character is reflecting on a particularly emotional moment. And, well, we have a really great demonstration of that right here in The Producers. See, the 2001 stage production of The Producers was a musical adaptation of the 1967 film of the same name that wasn't a musical. And thankfully in 2005, they made a film of the musical of the film that is more or less a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the stage production production, for better or for worse. So you can go through and compare these two and really see where, why, and how adding musical numbers to a non-musical film works. If you pay attention, this awkward film actually perfectly demonstrates how every single number in this show is about defining how a character feels. Toward the beginning of the original film, there's a moment where Max is taking Leo on a lunch date to the park and trying to convince Leo to go along with their plan of ripping off old ladies. In the musical, they split this moment into two numbers, We Can Do It and I Want to Be a Producer. This scene serves to demonstrate what both these characters want. Max Max wants to go ahead with the plan, he thinks that they can pull it off. And right here during this fountain scene, Leo has this epiphany that his life has been terrible and he wants to change it. I want everything I've ever seen in the movies! Leo, say you'll join me! I'll do it! And in the stage show, both characters get musical numbers to give them time to define and explain exactly how they feel about the situation. We can make our dreams come true. Cause it's everything I'm not unhappy. This is a perfect utilization of the medium and the rest of the show follows suit. As we're introduced to characters, they define themselves through song. And while you might be thinking, what the hell does Gutentag Hopklop have to do with telling us about what Liebkin wants? Well, it actually does a really good job. Think about it. 
He's an idiot. Liebkin is a mindless drone. He's stuck in that zealous Nazi mindset. He doesn't think for himself at all. The only thing going through his head is fascist propaganda. There's really nothing else we need to know about him because there's nothing else he really thinks about. We get a similarly one-dimensional, albeit poorly aged and homophobic sentiment when it comes to Roger Debris and Keep It Gay. We know exactly what he thinks musicals should be, and he tells us what he wants, a show that'll get him a Tony. Tony, 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 Tony. And Ula gets her own number demonstrating what she thinks you're supposed to do when you've got it. Even the old lady investors get their own number explaining how they feel about Max. Every character in this show gets a moment to sit down and scream to the audience how they feel, why they feel that way, and what they want from their own unique perspective. This lays out a foundation for characters to change as things happen to and around them in the show. What was a throwaway gag in the original film about Max purposefully doing a terrible job at bribing a critic becomes a number that simultaneously demonstrates Leo's naivety around the theater and Max's hellbent determination to have this show fail. Paralleling the opening two numbers, we can do it and I want to be a producer, but this time with Max and Leo working together. And this is where the emotional crux of the show really nails the landing. At the end of the film, Leo makes this heartfelt speech about Max changing his life for the better. They still end up in prison, but Leo makes his feelings heard. This man, this is a wonderful man. He made me what I am today. This is exactly the kind of scene that makes for a great musical number. But not only that, this is where we finally hear these two characters singing in harmony. My empty life filled it to the brim. When they aren't singing about Hitler, every number either defines a character and how they feel, or demonstrates how the circumstances have changed and gives that character an opportunity to redefine themselves. These songs are the heart of the show. Music, for me anyway, is information. It's a way to get character and plot information across. So you want music to be information. You want it to develop story or character in some way. So the song will carry its own weight and justify its existence in the film. If you don't know who that is, then hi, I'm Sideways, and I'm going to make this joke every time I bring him up until every single human being on Earth knows his name. This is Howard Ashman, the genius behind The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, and the guy who brought Disney out of the grave in the early 90s. He knew that what you want to do is take the most emotionally significant moments of your show, the times when your character is just figuring out how they feel about something, and convert them into song and have the characters sing it at the audience. And this is why I never shut up about these movies. Ashman knew he had to keep them simple, and that's what these films are perfectly simple. These films are a perfect demonstration of getting as much information in as few musical numbers as possible while still holding up a film with a 90 minute runtime. The beauty is in their simplicity. They open with a number that sets the audience's expectations and establishes their suspension of disbelief. Okay, this is a world where people sing, cool. Then you need a main character to connect to the audience and tell them what they want. Then you want to do the same thing for the villain and the sidekick characters, you want to know how they feel about all this too. Then you need a love song, and that's it. And if you want more about this kind of thing, then go check out my video on a Goofy movie. Just take those tent poles that are the emotional focus of the story, turn them into song, and have the dialogue connect everything together. And you're done. That's it. You've got a show. Maybe you throw in something for a secondary villain, something about a village mob or a French guy murdering a crab, but for the most part, your job is done. They are the concentrated essence of this style of musical storytelling. If musical theater was a soup that you left simmering in a pot overnight, these films are what you'd wake up to in the morning. They are the essential oils of musicals, if you will. And that's why I like them so much. And I think that's why Disney has struggled so much in trying to adapt them. This whole live action Disney remake fad started in 2010 when Tim Burton's adaptation of Alice in Wonderland accidentally almost made a billion dollars. Four years later in 2014 and every year after that we've gotten a live action remake of a Disney film. Maleficent, Cinderella, The Jungle Book, Christopher Robin, Dumbo, and while they changed a lot of the music or just cut the music outright, it always seemed like they couldn't quite get rid of all of it. It was too integral to the identity of these films. Pink Elephants on Parade doesn't do anything, neither does Colonel Hathi's March if you cut out Colonel Hathi, which you can do and still have the movie make sense. There are numbers and by extension characters that you can just cut out and not change the story at all. But at the same time, there are some characters that are inextricably linked to their musical numbers and are crucial to the story. Baloo is so enthusiastically carefree that he has to sing about it. It's just like Akuna Matata. He is aggressively laid back. It's also the entire focus of Baby Mind. Dumbo and his mom are the backbone of the story. But in 2017, when they got to Beauty and the Beast, all of a sudden you have a problem. With the intense focus on integrating the music and the storytelling, you could 
couldn't really remake the Renaissance films, especially Ashman's, without including all the music. These numbers are the soul of how these films work. So when you have these live action Disney remakes of the Renaissance films, the songs are stitched into the fabric of the story. You can listen to the songs and get the story, but you can't have the story without these songs. Howard said if you can take a song and you can remove it from the script, and the script still makes sense, you, you haven't done your job properly. In The Producers, when Max is in prison, he sings a song called Betrayed. By golly, gee whiz, I wonder what he's trying to convey to the audience. But in that number, he's summarizing what's happened throughout the show. But instead of just singing what's happened, he's able to go through a medley of all the musical numbers and get the same idea across. Boondog, hop, hop, boondog, pop, pop, step two, hire the director, keep it gay, keep it gay, keep it two, three, kick to Because the musical numbers and the core of the narrative are one and the same. And that is the problem with the remake of Mulan. The problem with the remake of Mulan is that they cut all of the music, but they did not replace it. If you want to make a stage musical out of a non-musical film, then you have to take the most emotionally intense scenes and convert them into songs. So it stands to reason that if you want to take a musical and convert it into a non-musical film, then you need to take those same musical numbers and turn them into emotionally intense scenes, which is not what we get in Mulan. It's all the dialogue of a musical, but without the musical numbers. It's all the connective tissue, but no vital organs. It's lucky charms with no marshmallows. The whole movie is go to the place, do the thing, go to the place, do the thing, go to the place, do the thing. There's rarely a moment where the plot stops and the audience is given the chance to learn about these characters. And that's the biggest complaint people have had about this film. It feels soulless and hollow, and that's why. But really, the problem is the supporting characters, the charm, the charisma of the general interactions with the characters. One of the biggest problems with this film is that it seems to omit certain things that are integral to the story or at least to the characters and their journey through the story. Because Li Shang and Mushu and the Cricket and the Grandmother and Mulan's three friends all had personality. Something this movie has absolutely none of. Not a single character in this movie is memorable. Not even the titular character. We never get a moment to learn about Mulan's wants. Really, think about it. How does this Mulan feel about having to hide her chi? How does she feel about all this matchmaker stuff? We don't know. She never tells us and she never has a conversation with anyone about it. We just get this awkward shot holding on her face where she looks mildly constant. In the original, we learn about Mulan's wants through one of the most awkwardly written lyrics ever. Help me not to make a fool of me. Mulan wants to be good at doing the whole traditional wife thing, which is why she's willing to cheat by writing notes on her arm. But she just isn't good at it. It isn't who she is. I mean, she doesn't explicitly want to be a wife. She wants to bring honor to her family, but the only way she can do that is by being matched by the matchmaker. And to not uproot my family tree. But she sucks at it. And even when she's trying to be someone she's not, even if it did honor her family, she feels like she's lying to herself. So all she really wants is a way for her to be herself, but also bring honor to her family and be valued by her community. And I know all that because she sang it to me. I would break my family's heart. Something that's always bothered me about the original is how people characterize Shang Yu as the villain of the film. He's not. He's a plot contrivance that moves the story along. He's a ticking time bomb to keep things moving. The real conflict here is Mulan being able to succeed without having to compromise herself. Yeah. She can't keep lying to herself. When is she going to be able to be herself, but also succeed in the world? The real villain here is... Let's get down to business. Okay, chill. It isn't Li Shang. The villain is the expectations being placed on Mulan. You can't make a man out of Mulan because she's not a man. She's going to have to figure out solutions to what are perceived to be manly problems in a non-manly way. That's what makes the Arrow Challenge so satisfying. She's figuring out how to be successful in the world in her own way without compromising herself. This is why this story works so well. It's why they have to bring the music back when her friends all dress like concubines and utilize her way of climbing poles to rescue the Emperor. Right here, I'll make a man out of you isn't about literally making a man out of you anymore. It's about making you the best you that you can be. You can't just say a few lines from the song and expect it to have the same emotional impact. That's like watching 90 Day Fiance and expecting everything to go smoothly. That's not the point of the show. Ugh. Like, okay, look. Pay attention. This song isn't just about three lonely dudes stalking around on Twitch at 2am. The number opens with them talking about how much they don't want to be there. In a thundering herd, we feel a lot like cattle. 
They start fantasizing about girlfriends as some kind of disassociative coping mechanism to get away from the torture of having to march for miles and miles every day. In a way, this number shows how they're also subjected to cultural expectations, while also gracefully demonstrating that even though they're being forced to be in the military against their will, and that sucks, it doesn't mean that they're exempt from any criticism. Who always speaks her mind? Nah. You can't just say lines from the song and think that that does anything. I don't care if they have titties in a tube, and I don't care what you're looking for in a girlfriend because the writers forgot to give each and every one of you a personality. <sighs> but the real death blow here is that on top of cutting the songs without even attempting to replace them with anything that's even remotely as narratively meaningful, they included references to the numbers in the score. Now that's a huge problem. So, um, speaking as someone who uh, recently turned 30, the Disney Renaissance films have had a profound effect on my generation. Uh, I'm driven by finding that McNugget sauce. Nuggets. I want that Mulan McNugget sauce, Morty. And the Disney company knows that. They are very clearly marketing these films to adults who have children who saw these films when they were kids and now want to take their own kids to see the new updated versions. So what's weird is that you're referencing music that you cut to an audience and a demographic that knows all of the words to all of the songs. So by cutting all the songs, but then including that music in the score, not only are they directly referencing a better film, they're also reminding us of how empty this one feels. They're specifically directing our attention to the gaping holes in the emotional fabric of the film. We here bring honor to us all, but it does nothing to tell us about what this Mulan actually wants or is trying to do. And we hear reflection over and over and over again. They basically play it like Mulan's gonna be a part of the Avengers and this is her theme. But it means nothing because it only serves to remind us how little we actually know about what this Mulan really wants. It's astonishing to see how a film with a budget twice the size of Cats somehow ended up the way that it did. Like, I'm not one to show for companies, but I'm just really floored that the same company somehow made both of these movies. Even if he wasn't alive to work on the original, it's crazy to think about how much of a lasting impact Ashman's legacy left on the company. And at the same time, how much Disney just has absolutely no idea what they're doing anymore. All right, that's it. Dishonor. Dishonor on your whole family. Make a note of this. Dishonor on you. Dishonor on your cow. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible with an extra special thank you to Alec Kulikowski, Alex Klinkert, Always Posh, Andy Muse, Andrea Chenier, Artemy, hey Artemy, R2 Dan2, Ariella Jaglom, Charlie Holly, Christian, Daniel Johnson, Darren Almgren, Don Marie Kieran, Dokos, Dr. Eyebrows, Edith with the Man Hands, Ella Ryra, Elise and Thomas Constantine, For the Horde, Free Anne, Google It, Gregory Holdenis, Hayden Jandro, Huyen Tu Dao, I don't trust anyone who isn't honest about their addiction to ice cream, I want you to tell me if my fear is justified that no one will pay attention to me if I'm honest about my addiction to ice cream, I worried that when I started the Ice Cream Eaters Emotional Support Group, I would really just needed support for wanting to eat, it was too long before but Ice Cream Dude is valid, Jason Kim, Jeff Bridges but you can call me the dude, Joe Engel, John Egbert, Joseph Spiros, Josh Bacte, Justice for the DS Erie and Andrew Lambert, Justin Harley, Justin Sargent, Karen Rosenau, Knight of Chaos, Looney, Majors Ladwina Elizabeth IV, the Lanyard Ging, Quen Ging Gu, Michael Hubbard, Mike Wisnuck, Mr. Kamisama, Myron John Tatarin, Nicole, Nicholas Cohen, Nora Konico, Prelock, Ra Ra Rasputin, Russia's greatest heat machine. Rachel Augsburger, Rafael Martinez Sales, Raquel Monterosa, Ravenhorn, Rich Marzullo, Rick Osborne, Rose is a secret sociopath and I'm oddly okay with that, Ryan Vick, Snaps Guys Tell Sideways to Stream More, Sidewaytastic Mr. Ben, Stupid Dog, Tabitha Ockelford, Take That, Rewind It Back, Sideways Music Theory, Make Your Brain Cells Go Clap, Terra Femiera, Transpanic Power Hour, Vox, Wisdom Minari, You Are Loved, You Are Valid, You Deserve to Live, You Are Not the Exception, you shall call me the pumpkin queen and a new symbol that uh, Google Translate cannot tell me how to pronounce. I'm very sorry. Please tell me how to pronounce your name. And Bacon Lisk, Fenwise and Tom, Gable Larson, and Justin Sargent.
I'd also like to thank everybody who requested that I talk about Mulan. This was actually a lot of fun. I finally got to talk about opera, so that's nice. Uh, if you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching. So credit where credit's due, it sounds like Rickson Williams actually did put a little leitmotif for Mulan in this film. And protect the Emperor. But it just got so buried in all the other problems that I really didn't know what to say about it. I just wanted to bring it up and calm all the angry people that were going to show up in the comment section.